Kia ora. Just extend that the welcome to the space that, that Sophie's given. Um, and you know, the trustees are always delighted to um, have a variety of activities take place. So just a really brief overview of the history of the bowling club and the community group for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, essentially it was a very quiet bowling club in the early 2010s with not many members left and in about 2014 a group of locals when the building was about to be put on the market decided to actively try and um, obtain the building from the bowlers effectively and so after a couple of years of negotiation um, that was successful and the community group which is a charitable trust now owns the building um, and in those very early days and in fact even before the bowling club existed Barbarian Productions were renting a little bit of space for storage of their um, costumes from the bowlers um, so it, it's had a kind of connection to the arts even while it was still an active sports facility um, and so we're now there you go you can see Joe um, in the early days and she's still got that same um, storage cubby that you will walk past just as you come up the stairs full of costumes um, and I'll talk a bit more about Barbarian later but they're still a, a key tenant in the building um, so we're now a community centre effectively we get um, great support from the council um, to manage the hall and the green and to support the, the running of this building um, as Sophie mentioned, some of my early involvement was um, community engagement exercises. There was a thing called the Kaka Project um, back in around 2015, over a few years that some people may remember, a council community collaborative exercise. Um, and there were a number of community engagement workshops um, using collaborative decision making um, techniques to decide how the precinct could evolve as a community space and what it could offer and what it could be in seven generations time. So at the moment we've got a community kind of social enterprise cafe open um, four days in the mornings paying living wage and losing money but we're doing it as a third space as Sophie mentioned just a community drop-in space with really good coffee. Um, and we've just re recently lost Damascus, they've moved down to Torrey Street. Um, as Sophie mentioned, they've got a new restaurant down there now. So they had started off as a food truck and grew into needing more space. We've now got Smoked and Pickled who have provided some food tonight. Um, they're just starting, they're in their third week and again have come from a food truck. Um, and then we've now got a bar as well. So this is um, happens to be a a community dinner. We ran a series of um, community dinners. There have been different focused events. Um, we've had refugee meals. Um, we've had throughout the um, collaborative exercises early on, we had a series of um, local chefs come and cook, and we've sort of extended that sharing of kai to building or well, establishing a community wood fired oven. Um, so that's open to the community, there's a, um, it's going to be lit this Sunday if anyone's around. Um, so a variety of events take place amongst the precinct. Um, it's becoming known as a bit of a music venue. This is um, a Vogelmorn session event over in the hall. Um, there's a number of national touring acts come through. Couch sessions, which is a kind of acoustic Sunday afternoon series that has been run in this space um, over the last few years and seems to have been really well received by the kind of local music community because it's all focused on the music um, and it's a very non-commercial activity basically um, and kind of afternoons family friendly kids playing out on the trampoline and the lawn um, and the space is used for a huge variety of things, um, community nights, it's bookable as a local um, venue for kids birthday parties and 50th birthday parties, um, there's weddings in the hall etc. Um, there's a series of regular working bees, so this is the um, native garden being planted by the community down that you would have walked past as, just as you came in. Um, and that idea of a third space and bringing 
kind of the vitality of urban life to the suburbs is sort of extended through to trying to activate it in the evening as well um, because in the sub suburbs you tend to find that most people are at work or at school during the day um, and the cafe is great to have and we're trying to extend that to make it more accessible to more people um, but one of the ideas for the bar is to try and have a, a, an evening drop-in space for the community to meet and discuss ideas and hold events and have that support it. Uh, so as I mentioned Barbarian have been here from the start um, and there's um, a number of arts based practices, this was the rehearsals for transmission um, a couple of years ago, um, kind of COVID focused play um, and basically we, we try and make the building accessible and affordable to the arts community, um, partly just because we realise there's a shortage of spaces, there's a shortage of affordable spaces. Um, and so we try and not book too many regular recurring events to enable short rehearsal times, for example. So for example, for Transmission, they had this space every day for two weeks. Um, and there were only a couple of regular bookings that we had to move to other spaces to make that happen. Um, and obviously the space goes through lots of different guises and there's all sorts of different setups that happen. Um, so it can be you know, a messy creative making space at one moment and then a bar, um, another or a, an, a, you know, an event. Um, so yeah, a few of these slides are fo focused on Barbarian who are a very key tenant in the building um, and if you've poked your head around to the bar as you came in um, you see them kind of hidden behind some theatrical curtains um, and then when they have their office, hour office hours they open the curtains up and kind of spread out their kind of co-working space takes over the bar um, and they um, will sometimes take over the space as well. Um, for example, over the last few weeks, some of you may have had the pleasure of um, taking part in the You Are Here um, production, the Fringe Festival event. Um, and so there was a huge amount of activity through the building. They had like 28 actors and a whole lot of um, costumes and set production that happened on site, inside and outside. So it was really great to see all that activity and the engagement that happens with the community, people coming into the cafe and just accidentally discovering all that stuff and then deciding to go along to the event. It was really great. Um, yeah, so a bit more active, active making. So there's, there's one of the UI here props downstairs. Um, so as Sophie mentioned, there's a co-working space downstairs, um, which we're trying to enable a little bit of um, sort of makerspace activity um, with some tools to allow youth to come in and um, there's already some facilitated makerspace events that happen in the hall um, once a week um, that pop up in a van. So just recently we've um, put a bit of energy into um, signage and clarifying the tenants and the activities that happen in the building. Um, alongside the move to open the bar now that we've got a, a full license. Previously we've had special licenses for occasional events alongside mostly music events. So we've now got a regular community bar um, three days a week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, three to ten. Um, so we're essentially a, a zero waste, one minute, we're essentially a zero waste um, site we're aiming to be. So we've got composting and worm farms and everyone has to treat it like a camping hut. If they book the event, they have to take away what they bring. Um, and so the bar is effectively zero waste. Everything's, or well, 90% of it's on tap, um, beer and wine and all local. Um, and we've priced all of the um, products that aren't zero waste more expensive to discourage people using them. So essentially the bar, there's the barbarian guys behind the curtain this morning. The, um, the bar, the idea of the bar is to um, hopefully subsidise, if it's successful, subsidise 
the building, effectively, all the other activity that happens. Um, we're still kind of the cheapest beer in town, hopefully, so it can be affordable to the community. Um, but we want to keep a super accessible booking um, availability space for arts and music events, um, as well as subsidise the cafe as a kind of third space. Nisam Bulivinaka, um, I greet mana whenua, traditional custodians of this land. Um, I'm sure I speak for, all of, uh, for us all in sending our compassion and prayers to all those who have been lost, who have lost mm -hmm. everything in the recent floods, those homes, work and loved ones who have been washed away. A warm vinaka vakalevu to Gisela, Sophie and the Wellington City Council team for calling this talanoa and for the groundbreaking work that you're doing for the arts and to Barbarian for hosting us. What does it mean to have a space? As a theatre maker and filmmaker, I approach these questions through my direct experience of creating work. My work is to tell stories. It's driven by a belief in the power of theatre and film to make social change. I believe change comes from shifting the way we see the world. When we change the story, we change the future. But what is the story that we need to change? We live in a colonised country in the Pacific, and that process was driven by a story. People who told themselves they had the authority to tell the whole story, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. Our space has been colonised, everything we do, every aspect of the environment we live in, it's written into our lives, from the street names to the layout of a city plan, to architecture, legal systems, the story we're told every day of who we are. This story colonises the spaces of our own minds. So when I create a space, it has to begin not with a room, but within oneself. What is my story? How can I stand in the barrage of the noise and even hear myself? We have to ask ourselves, what are the stories that need to be told? The answer is the stories that are hidden. We must reveal our stories that have been buried under layers of other narratives. I choose to serve the unheard, to give voice to the voiceless, Whose story is told and whose is hidden? Whose story is valued and whose is worthless? Whose story is polished with pride and put on the mantelpiece and whose is shadowed in shame? These are the stories and questions I ask myself as a Pacific storyteller. To speak, we have to find courage. And there are reasons why our stories are hidden and reasons why our voices are silenced reasons why our history has not been taught in school. It's been a long journey for me to build courage, and it certainly didn't come overnight. It's been about 30 years. Um, for our stories to emerge as Pacific people, we need to create a space within a space and a world within a world. The space needs to be held by our own cultural values, and we need to have sovereignty over it. Even then, it takes real time for people to emerge. Over the last 20 years with the conch, the question of space to exist has been very central. People talk about the need for new theatres and art centres, while all the time many of our great artists are wandering around homeless. As the great Makarita Uriley said to me once, Nina, if you're an artist, how can a painter paint without a studio? Over the last 20 years, the conch, we've needed a home. We've been taken in by many institutions, universities, drama schools, and these homes have been temporary. I've worked in church halls and even in a corridor just to keep the work going. Months of work can arrive in a space for a matter of weeks only to disperse again. To be homeless in a region where there are indigenous is particularly challenging. We see this every day on the streets of Wellington. So the question of space is not so simple. The facts have to lie at the heart of any discussion about space. And when it comes to space for Pacific people, these facts really need to be listened to. 
and the conversation needs to be led by those people in a space which holds the value of these people. For this we need a home to invite you all into for a cup of tea and a biscuit or a bowl of kava. Such spaces create extraordinary change. If we think of the depot theatre and the revolution of Māori and Pacific work that came from it. Think of Te Hau Kainga, um, which Takirua, ourselves, the Conch and Tawata came together to form in 2015. The Conch is on for the first time on the verge of having such a space for Pacific <coughs> Arts, which is very, very exciting. And um, we are very, you know, soon to um, announce. So it's really um, a wonderful thing to be in really deep conversation with the Wellington City Council. So we're really honoured to um, be here tonight. Um, <clears throat> sorry, we've all been living for the past three years in a time of uncertainty. COVID has led us to shutting down a lot of creative spaces. As, pe as creative people, we've been hit hard, but also as creative people, we know uncertainty lies at the heart of our creative process. We're extremely resilient in, a fa in, the, in the face of uncertainty. Though we are dominated by people demanding that we describe our process or outcomes two years in advance, we know that every creative journey is only tru truly joyful when there is uncertainty. Only then do we voyage into the unknown. Only then do we innovate. And so when spaces are shut down or pathways closed, we have to innovate to survive. Such a moment arrived for the conch in 2020 with our player boy called Piano, when our, our nine city tour was canceled overnight. The whole space we had created meticulously planned was completely canceled. We had teams of creative people on employment with the, dis with the continued belief and support, we, we sidestepped and decided to make a film. When physical space is closed down, we have to think carefully and step into the digital space or the virtual space. It was the digital moana, the wasa wasa. It was unknown for us all. First time for me to fake, make a film and Fat Moana to tell his story in this form. New pathways of relationships building, new funding partnerships and a huge array of new skills and thinking, all prompted by not being able to do what we wanted, by the shutting down of a space. The journey of the boy called Piano has turned into a remarkable, um, it's had been a remarkable journey with um, some international awards, a Human Rights Award in Mexico, and lots of selections with film festivals. It's journeyed into Parliament at the invitation of a cross-party coalition of ministers, Carmel Sepuloni, Calvin Davis, Marama Davidson, Mark Mitchell, and Ingrid Leary. In the space of Paparoa Christchurch Men's Prison, to an audience of 38 inmates, Dingwall's Trust with social workers, and most recently in two Tahitian prisons. In terms of um, audience, an audience and how one can reach, I suppose, into the, into the homes through television, social engagement has led us into new partnerships beyond arts funding. This brings a space for, for growth, which is only limited by a human capacity to meet it. The future itself is a space full of uncertainty. Just as we cannot continue to rebuild the face of repeated floods, we need to embrace this uncertainty and respond in innovative ways. I believe that this also asks us to come into relationship with new ways of working, to recognise the space between us all as community and our needs to enliven our values and be true to our collaborative process. I believe that the world is actually full of abundance, abundance and not scarcity, and that the fluidity of uncertainty is in fact change. Uncertainty is also great potential. We are here to help find solutions, and we hope that the space is open today can be a catalyst for such change. Naka.
Kea ki nui, kea ku uh, tamarahi, kea ku whakatamarahi ki te rangi o te whare. Tēnā tātou, tēnā tātou katoa. Nā mihi nui i te rangatera, nā mihi to um, te haukainga o te mana whenua o pōneke. Pōne Ai, pai tō kōrero. Ko kais ahi pini hoi te tēnei, nō uri o te apauri, te rarua, me nā pui, me te arua, nā te whakaue, um, tū haurangi nā te wāhia, me uh, kahunu tu wharetua, me raukaua ki te tonga. I'm blessed. I have a whakapapa that takes me from the, from the, the tail of the fish all the way to down this way. Okay, and um, my mummy's from up the very far north, my grandmother's from Te Hapua. Uh, we have whenua up there. And then she takes care of that first half of the hukianga. I grew up in the hukianga. And um, I grew up with sand dunes and diving and fishing and, and living very much in um, the, <laughs> showing my age, the, the late 60s and 70s as, as a mokopuna that um, my father had the reo, my mother refused to let us learn um, because she was strapped at school. And um, so learning te reo was a lifetime journey for many of us. But in the meantime, I've had um, a wonderful journey. I've, I've done all sorts of different, um, different jobs from driving forklifts to um, electrical processes right down to being a lab technician and my first study was in microbiology. And it was actually my father's passing that um, I decided, I saw this ad and decided to change my profession, which was working out at Lincoln at Ministry of Ag and Fish as a laboratory technician working in plant protection and biological pesticides. Um, and so I saw this ad, yep. And I bought my first home at the age of 22. But I saw this first ad um, and it was at the Hagley Theatre Company and in Christchurch. And um, my father had taken us from the Hukianga. Mum and Dad were both reverends. Mum was a nurse, Dad was a mechanic. And we went to high school at Burnside High School. So it was a massive transition from the Hukianga <laughs> to, to um, Christchurch. So that was a, a, a big awakening. But actually it was um, a really interesting way of um, giving us a real wide world view. And so anyhow, I saw the ad, went along, the course was full, uh, the guy said there, sorry, it was all full up, said then, come into my office, went to the office, phone call went. It was someone cancelling out of the course. I got him. Then I ended up at drama school a few years later, and now I'm still, and I'm now I'm here with the council. But along that way, I've done the protest march as mana whenua um, in Te Arawa, um, Te Puya, the Māori Arts and Crafts Institute, New Zealand Māori Arts and Crafts Institute. Now, it's really interesting, I have, I've, it's just in the last week, um, been elected onto the iwi board, which owns uh, a big portion of Te Puya. Now, within Te Puya, we have an entity called um, New Zealand Māori Arts and Crafts Institute. Now, my nanny was a guide, and my nanny before that was a guide at Whakarewerewa Valley. And when I left CNZ, I want to go home because my mokos were all growing up there. So I became Guide Grace at Whakarewerewa. Now, when you come into our valley, we greet you with kia ora. Welcome to Te Whakarewerewa Tango o Te Upitoa a Wahiao. And came and we go, whoa. And basically, that is the name of our valley. And it means the uprising of the war party of the chief Wahio. Okay? And so when our people used to go to battle, they'd go to Pohotu, the geyser. And they would do the piru piru, the jumping haka. And they would prepare for battle there. So you can imagine 500 men um, jumping this haka, this piru piru. And what was interesting is that it would raise the dust, but the earth's crust is very thin there, so it would also raise the steam, hence the whakarewerewa, the uprising. And of course, Wahiao was the war leader, the war chief for Tuharangi. Okay, and Tuharangi was an interesting man, he was apparently nine foot tall. So yeah, can't argue with the tūpuna there, I just must not have forgot that line. But however, in um, all of this happening and everything, the Tohunga Suppression Act came out in 1910, our, our nannies were guiding for many years. They didn't have bridges. They would carry people over on their backs. And that was how the tribe would visit us. We were touring this. We had the pink and white terraces, and we also had Whakarewerewa Valley. The pink and white terraces, they used to charge 10 pounds to go across on the boat back in, back in 1880. And that's a lot of money in those days. It's a lifetime, uh, you know, a whole year's wage for some people. So anyhow, when Tarawera blew, it was three mountains that blew. 
And so they came over to join us. Three, one, Tarawiro was three cones one, in one volcano that exploded. And that, the story that comes from that was Naitiroirangi had buried a tanifa in there, three tanifa, and when the explosion blew, it took out everyone around. Okay, now happening in this time, our nannies were guiding and they would pay, uh, they would charge sixpence or shillings. It was how they survived. It was the bread and butter of our people. It's how they got food for the family, was through tourism. And the interesting thing about this is the government saw it as an ideal way and started taxing our nannies. So our nannies would charge a shilling for a tour and things like that, or you could a shilling for a hot, a hot bath and a mini mini and shilling for a stay over. So they started charging our nannies taxes and they made us register in 1905. You had to register as a guide so they could take the tax. And then they wanted the jewel in the crown, which was the geothermal valley. So they took it. As the government did at that time, because they said we were unsanitary and not looking after the land and things like that, as they had these photos of Alfano sitting in the hot pool baths. But it was all this kind of stuff that led to, then Apirana Nata came along and he could see that Māori arts and crafts was disappearing because of the act. We weren't allowed to practice our, our original traditions and Tāmuko was almost gone. And so Zapirana Nata, he had this idea to put together this institute. And so that's what he did. He went around all the iwis and he came together and he thought, okay, how am I gonna do this? So he put this idea here to have it here. And why, we often ask why did he do that? There were carvers on the East Coast that were beautiful. It was that the tourism dollar would pay for it. Okay, so the tourism dollar came into the mix and it was how, how the government didn't have to pay to save the arts that was disappearing, they could use the tourism dollars. Okay, moving up into, the, into um, 1965, an act was put into place, the Māori Arts and Crafts Institute Act 1965. The government really took control of everything. The business our nannies had built had been taken over completely by the government in 65. And it carried on right up until 2020. Okay, March 25th, 2020, that's the day COVID was announced, was the day that they were returning the Tapuya, the New Zealand Māori Arts and Crafts Institute to us. So we got the phone call, it was being delayed because Jacinda was going to make an announcement. Understandably so. So we sat back, we thought, okay. But we had to fight hard to get there. I had many a, an arguments on the phone with, um, <laughs> with the minister, Peter Sharples at the time, and saying, and Mitsurinui and Parikura, and saying, no, no, no. We held a protest up there on our land in the valley, and we put the Tino flag up, and they said, you're going to stop the tourism from coming in. I said, no, Carl, it's a symbolic one. We're just going to go all over TV and say that you've stolen our land and we want it back. So that's what we did. So we did it as, as we used the media. We had plenty of Māori media friends and that's what we did. Um, so then that's when Peter Sharp was called and said, what do you want? They had created this board of eight with no one, no mana whenua on it. And so they were deciding what was happening to our business. And they had to be ministerially appointed. And we're like, no, nah, that's not on. We want to have at least one person on that board. And so we fought hard. And in the end, after five days of camping out up there, asked for a sign from our tūpuna, as we do. And Pōhutu normally blows for 20 minutes. That day, Pōhutu blew for four hours. And it wasn't until the guides came along and said, oh, look, the tūpuna recognises the uri, recognises the mokopuna the, living there. And so, and then Peter Sharple's phone call went, he goes, OK, we'll give you your, your day. He said, all we want is a vote in our meeting house. So we got that, we marched down, we got a vote, and we put Donna Hall in. And she's a formidable lawyer and scary in most ways. Um, and the, the thing is that we fought hard to have that. And we finally, after many, many years later, 2020, we finally got to sign in July that year. But COVID had happened. And you see, this is a $42 million business and the dollars just went out the door with COVID. Okay, so that, that was the reality for us. It went out the door. And the government was like, well, they were, they were giving it back to us and people go, oh, they're giving this wonderful gift back to us. I said, no, they're returning, returning stolen property. Do you mind? And so um, they gave it back. 
But of course, everything went out the window with COVID. And so, um, and in the new act is now called Māori Arts and Crafts of, um, Institute Vesting Act. So they vested it in the three mana whenua that sit in the valley. We have 50% of it and the other two, we have 25% of it each. And so we've got a, a fantastic board with some real nails on it. But when you've got COVID, it doesn't matter how much nails you've got on it. At the end of the day, you still have to go cap in hand and ask for support to make it still survive. Now, we have diversified and they've got all sorts of restaurants and things like that that have kept it alive. And now we see the tourism market is starting to turn and people are starting to return. But it was the key objective of the tourism was to actually keep the Māori Arts and Crafts Institute alive. Now the school alone has turned out, um, we don't recognise any NZQA or anything like this. From here comes master carvers and master weavers. We also have a bronze foundry, but now we've added performing arts and I made sure they put in contemporary in there too, into the act. So then it's part of it all. So we can, no matter what the performing arts is, it's all always got a home. And so the, the, you know, it's about um, being able to see what the future can hold for our generations, for our next generations coming along. Now we've had master carvers. Every whare nui basically around the country that's been redone is usually done from a master carver from out of here. Uh, Lionel Grant is a classic, um, classic, wonderful contemporary and traditional artist. Um, he did the Chelsea Flower Show a few years back and, and won all the accolades around there. Or Kiwi Shook Goods, another one that came out of the Institute. He won the Tokyo Ice Sculpting Competition, all these kind of accolades. And there's beautiful artists like Erinora Pukitapu Hetit and Angimari Hetit that were on the board that founded a lot of this. And so they put some great practices in place to make sure that we, we upheld the, the tikanga that they had laid down. Um, and so when we're looking at spaces and how we develop as, as a, um, a business, there's always had to be a sideline side um, about being able to stay alive within the industry. And so with, with a lot of our whanau, they went back to even making hangi dinners on a Friday night, but they would sell several thousands of them. And this is during COVID, in order for this to happen. They went back to some of the more traditional methods to stay around and stay functioning. Um, tried not to take loans because the, we can't afford the loan because we didn't get any money with the business, we just got the business. But like I said, that was post COVID, it already started. Um, so it's been real a big journey for, for our different um, tourism business, but a lot of it is about keeping our art and culture alive. In fact, all of it is. And that's the thing. Um, my mokopuna has just finished doing matatini and they came second, so they were very happy first time. Um, but it has been, been amazing watching them develop and perform. And all of it's done for aroha, just like I do with theatre. And, and a lot of the times, like Nina, I'm sure you've made many a shows out of Aroha, and, but it would be nice to be able to, you know, have enough to pay the bills. But creating an, an, an industry that's supported from itself being, you know, and I talk to visual artists all the time about having a bread and butter line. You can have your high end art, but then you need a bread and butter line that's going to put the bread and butter on your table at home. Okay, so you can't always work in that high end side. So you have to think like a business person. So that's, that's one of the things with artists. We have to have many different hats to survive. Um, and so that's why we can transfer skills all over the place, because we've had to, to survive as an artist. Okay, so just, just with um, things like um, the beautiful weavers that have come out of here, um, I've just, you know, I, I'm really proud of the, the name Ahotini because it's a weaving term. The aho is the main uh, weft, uh, weft of the, the thread. And tini means many. And it's all about the crossing over and the weaving together of the different threads. And they'll always say, I, I, you know, when you guide at, at Whakarewa, you had to learn how to make a pew pew. So I learned that. Then I had to learn how to make taniko, which is the fine weave that you see on the bands. That's really hard. And it's all about the tension. And it's all about how you cross those threads over to keep the balance. And if, uh, you know, I'm no weaver. So I quickly gave that up and I'll stick with the theatre. 
but you realize that there's with a thread like ahotini and creating spaces where like the conch can have a home to create is really important. So when we look at the development of toy pōneke and, and seeing how we can weave that across, it's so many different sectors and so many different communities that we have to bring together. So yeah, that's just a little bit about, you know, knowing, seeing the hardness of, of, of um, coming and watching a business being built out of, um, out of a place of mamai, a place of pain. Um, that our nannies built this business from, and it was about surviving. And so each iwi has its own without the, within the country, their own product that they put across of how they survive. Okay, so and it's funny because I used to always call my tiara whanau plastic and, and fake, and then um, and I've got a clip across the ears, and then I realised actually that was just their survival technique. They know how to do. They know how to do concerts, they know how to perform, they know how to carve and weave. But I realised they did that in order to put food on their children's plate. So, you know, it's just the reality of, of working in spaces that are different. So that's me. Kia ora tato, namahiki a koutou.